The Unshackled Waves, episode 227. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Now, as you know, on this show, I'd like to introduce you to other Australian alt media personalities. One vlogger I have noticed who is particularly active on Facebook and YouTube, posting new videos every day, is Florian Heiser, who posts under the title Heiser Says. Adding to the conversation, he's based in Brisbane and is an architect by trade and a father, and he comments on topics that are in the daily news cycle, whether they be political or cultural or in his line of work, uh, normally from a libertarian point of view. Florian is my guest today to discuss his vlogging and the ideas that go into his videos. Florian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. Now you've come to my attention because I see you posting in a lot of the Facebook groups that I'm in and, and manage. So I've, I'm noticing that you're pumping out content uh, almost daily, so regularly, uh, which is quite impressive. I, w I wish I was that uh, productive. Now, my first question to you is, how do you manage this high turnover of, of videos? Because it's on the, the, the news of the day. And so obviously you've got a lot of motivation to, to pump out these videos. Well, I'll give you a bit of background as to how, why I started doing this. So, you know, I'm, I'm an architect and our practice, we slowed down a bit in the last couple of years, so I had to let people go. And I got to the point where I didn't have any staff working for me anymore and I had no one to red pill. So normally I'd be chatting to the boys and just discussing the news with them over the day. And uh, my wife started getting frustrated with me doing that to her. So I thought, you know <laughs> what, I'll do it on YouTube. I'll get it out there because uh, you, you know what? Well, you obviously know what young people are like from university. It's no different like that in architecture. So they'd be coming and telling me all these things. And I'd be going, that's rubbish. Look at this. Study this. And so I kind of missed that. And I thought, you know what, I'll, I'll start doing a, a YouTube video and, and putting it out there. Another talking head. Why not? And originally I was filming on my phone, you know, set up there and, and standing behind a, a bookcase uh, with a full beard. And just churning out a video, you know, every couple of months. And then uh, when I, you know, moved the office to our house and set it all up here, I thought, well, if I want to do this and I enjoy it, it's a good little hobby, I'll set it up so I can do it as efficiently as possible. So I've, uh, I've got my, my computer rig in front of me here. And I actually have six screens connected to the one machine. So, wow. That's, yes. that, that's a record. <laughs> Well, it's, when you have, um, you know, 12 staff working on drafting workstations and you compact it all down, I've got like three high-end graphics cards there and all, all these different screens in front of me. And that means I can jump from one thing to another really quickly when I'm putting together a cast and I don't need to edit. The goal is if I can avoid any post-production and get something out quick, which may be why my stuff looks a bit rougher than some of the polished things you might see out there. But... You know, I can respond and, and start a dialogue and, and add to the conversation on the fly. So this month, well, I think December, I, d I decided to do every month, every uh, a video once a day. February, I did again. And now in March, I'm trying to do two a day. I'm trying to do a morning video and a night video. And uh, the night videos get a bit hard sometimes, particularly if you want to do a little five minute chat and you start realizing, you know, you're reading about maybe feminists telling people how to raise boys and that turns into 30 minutes of you rambling but that's kind of the, the setup that I have and I think if I can respond to things as they happen you can have some interesting discussions with people and you know I'm, I what, what have I got now about 2,000 subs and uh, as well as a lot of the hate that you get when you put any ideas online you can you you start getting letters and, and emails from people that are really appreciative that there's some another professional or another business person that's actually talking about these things. Yeah, that's an interesting backstory there. I'm not 
sure what the the architecture industry is like myself but from what you've told me there's a lot of lefties there and so uh, you're making a good contribution there by uh, red pilling those young up-and-comers and yeah I've noticed in your videos that they're they're all in one take and you managed not to stutter or do too many ums and ahs which is very impressive I had a uh, in in architecture I used to tutor at university and what you have to do is you, you're a salesman essentially you put your design up behind you and you need to sell it you need to sell it to the crowd and I'd often I'd, I'd have my students I'd be ticking every time when they did an um so I said you did a fantastic presentation but you said um 30 times so you get trained you get trained to, to, to sell and to present so uh, well, you know, I got something from architecture school with regards to that. It's helping rant on YouTube about politics. Yeah, you've, you've certainly taken your, your skills and uh, your interests into this new field. So, uh, like, like I said, you've been a, a great addition. Now, you talked about the, the feedback you received. Now, with a channel that's at 2,000 subs, you're going to get a lot of discussion in the comments and with increased popularity uh, comes the the detractors what sort of negative feedback is it is it constructive or would you consider it just people who just want to troll you and try and antagonize you it's a mix but there, there's obviously constructive criticism like your head's bald and shiny put some makeup on or you said that name wrong uh, you know things like that or people having suggestions oh, I'd like you to look at this topic and generally when they're polite uh, you can have a civil civil conversation with someone but you'd see there's lots of trolls there are lots of dummy accounts where people will just throw rubbish at you try and antagonize you you know swear put racist things all over your comments and things like that and one thing I, I've learned is that according to the YouTube algorithm every interaction on a video is valuable so even if you have these trolls that are just throwing all this rubbish on your videos you can actually use it to your advantage. So you should just feed them a little bit, bait them with a few little pointed things to get them angry. And then you may have walls of text coming from these trolls in the comment stream. But then the algorithm says, oh, look, there's 50 comments on that video. It may be more popular. So you kind of use their own hatred against them. At least that's, that's what I used to justify putting up with some of the nullers. Yeah, in my experience, YouTube is a lot more friendly to, to people such as us. And from what you've just said, the, the algorithm tends to benefit controversy with with Facebook. And it should be noted that when we're recording, this has been the day of the, the, the big uh, Facebook chaos where a lot of Facebook uh, wasn't working. But uh, Facebook, they, they come down very hard on any sort of controversy. I, I did a, a video recently about the um, violence at Moomba that you had down in Melbourne, where, where it was the you know, a gang of African youths and a gang of island youths just punching up, essentially, for several hours. It happens every year. It's like an annual addition <laughs> to the festivities. Well, I, I, on a, I, th you know, I think they need to get some boxing rings and let the blokes you know, fight out to show off to the Sheilas, but you know, that, that's for the council, you know, Moomba to sort out. But I did a video about that and I thought I had quite a you know, sensible position. And you know when you put these things up on YouTube, they'll get you know, yellow flagged, instantly demonetized. Um, but they actually they monetize that one without having to even have a request in. And, and for me that was surprising because when you're saying gang violence in a title and you're showing a picture like that, the algorithm normally will just flag it just instantly. So I, I, I seem to get, if I'm judging what I'm saying in a public sphere by Google and YouTube's uh, assessment of it as worthy for all advertisers, so if it's safe for all advertisers, then I think you know Google probably has more respect for my free speech than Australian government has in some regards. We do the best we can under the restrictive social media rules. Yes, yeah, it, it is a challenging environment to play in. Now, on your channels, you talk a lot, one of your, the, the topics that you're passionate about is the, the role of men and fatherhood in, in modern society. Now, you're a father yourself. How do you approach that in real life? It's something you grow into, parenthood. It's something you grow into. You change as a person from when you first have a child to when the, the child grows up. Everyone's terrified of having kids 
because they think all of a sudden you've got a four-year-old or a five-year-old, but no, you've got a tiny little baby that just ooh and ahs and poos everywhere. And you mature as you go through that process. I, I see it with just the way I interact with my children. You know, if you, you watch anything about uh, Jordan Peterson's work where he's discussing raising children and, and rough play and things like that, and uh, hearing his discussions about it and then just seeing it and how I play with the kids, comparing myself to my wife. So Rachel will be not as, as playful with the children where, you know, I'll be picking them up, putting them over my shoulder, we'll be wrestling, we'll be having fun, we'll be playing, we'll be um, interacting with each other. And even uh, their uncle as well, you know, he's there playing with them a lot rougher than the, than the girls. And the kids just love it. They just adore it and they adore that attention. And there was a single mother that I know and uh, she, she brought her son over and friends with my little kid and they were all playing. And Frederick is, he just turned three, so he was two years old, little boy, and we, we got one of those Ikea bunk beds. And he loves climbing up there and he managed to climb up there and he was, you know, on the top and brave and we're going, good work, Frederick. And so his little friend went up with him and the mother went in there and said, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that. You're not a brave climber like Frederick. No, no, come down, come down. And she took her little son who was really proud that he's achieved this, grabbed her off and said, no, 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 you can't, you can't. You're not a climber like Frederick. That just, that really stuck to my heart and showed the difference there in, in parenting styles. Uh, we have a, a free range approach to parenting pretty much. We, our kids, we let them play, they get into mischief. You need to sacrifice everything one meter down in your house to your children's mental development. If you think you're gonna keep a clean house with four kids or even one kid, no, never gonna happen. That's a fantasy. And you compare that with helicopter parenting, which seems to be the, the hip way to, to parent with uh, feminists and their, I shouldn't say husbands, male, male partners, where uh, you basically not only live through your, your children, but uh, project like all of ba basically your life issues onto them. And you also treat them as your possessions as well. One of the interesting differences with how Rachel and I approached being parents because uh, Rachel is an architect as well. We met at uni, the old story, and we started a business together. And when we had children, um, Rachel brought the kids to work. So we had our own office, we were our own business, and we're architects so we can be a bit funky and weird. So we'd have a little baby there on the desk, the clients would come. We only had one instance when during a meet meeting the baby piddled on some plans, but the client didn't mind at all <laughs> and it was pretty funny but I'm in a bit of a unique position as a father I've been around all of my children right from the beginning I think it was um, two, the last child was two weeks after birth Rachel was already back working in the office and we'd have the staff there she'd never let me get the guys or I want I always threatened the boys the draftees that they'd have to change nappies if they didn't perform <laughs> but she wouldn't let me implement that policy apparently it goes against you know workplace health and safety <laughs> So we, we kind of had a, a bit of a different environment. It wasn't a normal environment with the kids around and just with me as a father seeing my children all the time. For Rachel, it was different for her because she was brought up in the, the typical feminine mindset of have a career, build this, focus on this. Then all of a sudden she was a mother and it took her a few years to kind of reevaluate her life goals and to say, oh, well, now I'm more of a mother and part architect than fully architect. And there was a recent uh, article I read about a, a feminist who raised three boys. And you can see she was having a, a, a crisis in her own identity. And this was coming out in what she was writing about actually being a mother and the fact that, okay, that means you have to kind of focus on the children. And the, the privilege and and luxury of the father is that he has to go work and doesn't really have a choice. He needs to provide. And for us, that was a really kind of stumbling upon the, the more traditional roles, gender roles that God forbid I can't say these days that um, we just happen to adopt over time. And once you embrace that as part of your life and you, you work together as a team, you can, you know, be quite happy and it all works out. But if you, if one of you is fighting against that, and I, I blame a lot of it on, on schooling and education, the message that's sent to young women as well. And uh, it's why we're getting a lot of the, the mess these days. Yeah, that's, I've heard that story before about women, how they're, they're very much 
when they're expecting to become mothers, they, they poach it in the progressive feminist mindset, but then they actually blossom in, hang on, uh, I've got to, I should reassess the way I approach work and how I look after the children. And uh, they, they actually turn it, well, they blossom as people, they, they turn into sort of much more fulfilled uh, people, which is, I think, what you're alluding to there. Yeah, that's a, a good way to put it. And it, it's not just for the mothers, it's also for the fathers. It, it, your entire perspective on life changes completely. It's, it's a phase shift. You go from, you know, being a boy to, to being a man because you've got now people that are completely responsible and dependent on you. And uh, the same thing happens with a, with a mother. There it's even, it's even more in some regards because, you know, they've got to feed them literally from their own body sometimes. Now, men's rights advocates, the, the stereotype is they're angry incels or they're uh, bitter non-custodial fathers, but you're, as you've just mentioned, happily married with a, with a young family. A and so it's not, the, the whole idea that men's issues need to be looked after, it doesn't come from a place of, well, I'm losing things in society. Uh, I feel that uh, life hasn't been kind to me. It's that, no, there, there are a whole bunch of men and boys who are being left behind. They're, they're unsure of who, who, the, who they need to be, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to address that. The problem these days is the whole idea of a fair go seems to have gone out the window. You know, Australia is a, a nation where we're all meant to be fair and equal and merit-based. And we've, you've got now, I do a lot of videos on, on men's rights issues because a lot of them are, fundamentally, it's, it's unfair how a lot of men are treated in society these days. And in, in the past, there was kind of an equilibrium established between a, a husband and wife or a male and female a man would be expected to make certain sacrifices and responsibilities, but also a woman would be expected to make certain sacrifices and responsibilities. Now you have the examples of where everything you listed there, the, the angry, stereotypical um, men's rights activist, where I'd, I'd argue a lot of it is, I'm, I'm probably coming at it more from a business perspective. And this came from the whole wage gap argument that's been you put forward. Myth. Myth, yes. Well, earnings gap. We'll call it the earnings gap, what it actually is. And how there's, there's still politicians that are talking about this like it's a real bloody thing. And I think when I was younger, I used to think politicians and university lecturers were, were smarter. And now I'm getting older and more grayer. Uh, I'm, I'm starting to realize, well, no, they're, they're not really any different to the rest of us. And they can be just, they can fall in these traps as well. My wife, Rachel, was involved on a committee to review the body of knowledge of the profession of architecture. So here architects in, in Australia have practice notes and these are hundreds and hundreds of notes that you need to study to be an architect to pass the exam or refer to as a professional. And they hadn't updated them for a few years so they called on volunteers and Rachel was really into this. She was on the, on the panel for a couple of years. She did a lot of work and which annoyed the hell out of me because that was I couldn't charge for that in the business. That was volunteer time. So I was frustrated. I'm going, bloody hell, come on. But anyway, often it would be after after work, after an argument, you go, just do it, do it, do it. And but then the Institute, our Institute of Architects, changed some of their policies and they they brought in directives to have gender attempt to achieve gender equality on all of their boards and all of their, their committees and all of their organizations. And that really brought it home to me that what I considered was a stupid joke that I'd laugh at at university at, you know, the, the stereotypical um, overweight lesbians at the university union with purple hair running around getting protests going, yeah, no, no one, no normal business person believes that uh, was now coming in mainstream. So, and Rachel got quite frustrated because her role on this uh, committee could have been entirely reduced to just being a gender gap tick box or a quota filler and that 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 got me interested in going why is a, an organization like this uh, committing discrimination purely based on your gender which should have nothing to do with your decision making process on on this and it just opened the pandora's box i started looking at all the the issues with regards to domestic violence and um i don't even want to talk about the family courts that's a whole other yeah a potential royal commission i think that we need to advocate for and you 
just had to see the reactions to International Women's Day, which by its name you thought would be a celebration of women's achievements, but it turned into another gender war day. Uh, Scott Morrison tried to make the point that uh, we don't want women's success to uh, be at the expense of dragging men down. And then we uh, saw one of the, the junior ministers in the, the government, Karen Andrews, say that with Me Too and sexual harassment accusations, uh, men shouldn't mentor women. Can you, can you blame blokes for not wanting to be in that risk? I've heard advice given to, to working men, like never be alone in a workplace with a woman, always have the door open, always if remain in view. So if any witnesses are, are walking past, they can see that you're not doing anything wrong. The, the problem is people are having to result, resort to these methods, not because of normal people, but through sociopaths that are going to take advantage of uh, these types of movements for their own political games, their own power games in these office environments. And you can hear all these stories if you talk to anyone in the office environment about, you know, the crazy nutcase or what's happening there. So I can appreciate why people are taking that on, but it's, it's kind of going to backfire on the whole, you know, third wave feminist movement. They're going to get to a point where men won't even want to engage or won't even hire women. I can I can bet you that'll happen. They'll just say, no, too high a risk. Sorry, HR, we're not going to do it. Then you only have the big businesses and the governments that have these quotas in place that have to start taking more and more on. But you know, that's just theory crafting. Oh, unintended consequences right there. Yeah. Now, as you're an architect, uh, architecture, building and construction has been in the news a lot lately. There's been a lot of uh, building uh, faults that have been in the news. The, the Opal Tower fault, uh, you've done quite a few videos on that. There's been concerns about cladding in a lot of the uh, apartment uh, towers that are being put up in, in Sydney and Melbourne. And so I'll begin by saying, how does your profession as an architecture blend with your political philosophy and views? Ah, that's, that's an interesting question because I, I align, well, more and more I, I push for individual liberty and responsibility. But then when I look at the complexity of a large tower building and just um, do we need to invest some authority in a third party, be it a state or maybe another apparatus, to try and put some controls on that process? I'm building a building because so I'm still dwelling on it I'm dwelling on that idea on how it can happen because as, as an architect I, I've worked on a variety of projects and uh, a lot of what's coming out now in with the Opal with lacrosse uh, and with um, Stanley Street I think as well down in Melbourne another another cladding fire there's over 1400 buildings in Victoria that have been that have got these issues with them now and we're starting to, I'm starting to appreciate that the general public is now being made aware of what a lot of us have seen in the industry. And traditionally how a building was, would be procured is you'd hire an architect and they'd manage the, manage the project for you essentially. And you'd have a certifier who would, in the old days would come from the authority, from the council, who would then have the, you know, the responsibility for certifying that the building was fit for occupancy. But it's all gone about face now and you've got a, a method of procurement of, of getting a building which is the design and construct model where you've got a, a developer will just uh, design a building up to a very limited amount of resolution but like a sketch design and then they'll send that out to different parties different builders to offer a design and construct service then you've got the builder up the top here taking the responsibility and everyone else is under them including the architect and including the certifier and the problem is that has huge conflicts of interest because your next meal is, could be coming from that builder. So what are you going to do when you say, no, sorry, you can't do that. They'll fire you, get someone else. The developer doesn't care. They get their product in the end and they're gone, long gone before the, the faults are discovered. So in some ways, the fact that this is being brought to light and like the Sher, uh, Sherwood Gold Report is looking at these uh, rectifications to the industry it, it's going to be a challenging time and it's not going to help either with the way the economy is going or confidence there 
Um, I just want to get a clarification. We hear a lot about engineers. They're the, they're the ones who have been looking at the Opal Tower. What's the relation between the architect and the, the engineer? It, it depends on the way the building's procured. So the engineer is responsible for the structure. So the architect will work with the engineer to ensure that there's a structure for the building. Now on Opal, it turns out that the, they designed the structures that they've drawn up the structure, you know, and it was compliant, but what was built wasn't as per what was designed. So there was a communication gap between the two. And it can get really messy, say if you're an architect, and this has happened to me, where you are required to hire the engineers underneath you. So I'm required to hire these engineers working under me as a subcontractor. So I engage them, I pay for their money, their paychecks, I, I, or their, their you know, fees, but I also take responsibility for them. So if an engineer makes a stuff up, then I'm personally liable for uh, their stuff up. And then they'd have to sue me and then sue them to get the money out. So it's, it's no surprise I've gone gray really quick in this profession because there's a, a high element of stress. But it all like uh, the example was on um, lacrosse there with the, the cladding. What happened there to the architect was the builder came and gave them a, um, a sample, a sample of cladding and said, oh, this is just as good as the other one. Uh, you know, the, the uh, compliant one that we spe you specified, can we approve it? So the architect signed off, you know, yep, looks okay. And uh, it, it's quite complicated about what happened, but what they should have done is they should have taken that and sent it to the engineer and sent it to the certifier and gotten approval from the, the rest of their team as well. So you're all meant to work together as a team to get a final outcome. And sometimes those communications can be strained depending on the way the building is procured. And building, it's a high stakes uh, profession because if there's a, a fault, it can be deadly. The, the most uh, prominent uh, example that I know of, you probably know of it, is the uh, Kansas City Hyatt walkway collapse where uh, over 100 people uh, died. Uh, that was in the, the early 80s. That just shows if there's... Because in other professions, if you make your stuff up, it can be easily fixed. But in architecture, engineering, building, if there's a really large fault, then, as you said, it, you, you can be liable for, for deaths, uh, anything. Well, yes, it's one. If you go back through the history of of disasters, you'll find there's, you know, say a, a warehouse in America where a whole lot of seamstresses are working, and they'd chained the tape doors shut, so they couldn't get out, and they all burned to death. So then legislation came in place to ensure that fire escapes weren't locked in place. And sadly, this is repeated all throughout history in the last couple of hundred years, where it would take a disaster to encourage a response from legislators to try and mitigate these risks. So we're just seeing that now with Sydney and the Opal Tower, there's calls for registration of engineers in Sydney. I don't think that would have made any difference because the engineers that worked on it, who in New South Wales, you don't need to be registered or licensed as an engineer to practice. In Queensland, you do. So the engineers that were working on it in New South Wales were already licensed in Queensland. So it didn't really matter when the other party does the work without you. So, I mean, this, this is where I come into conflict with my desire for individual liberty and uh, personal accountability with regards to not having the government put their, their foot on everything you do, is how can we manage the risk in these complex projects, these complex you know artifacts of our civilization and not put it all onto the poor buyer who gets screwed in the end because the builder's gone, he's gone bust, uh, the developer's gone, and then you hear all these body corporates have to pay everything themselves. Uh, how can we, we manage that risk for them? What what system can we set up? And I think we're trying to, trying to work through that in the next few years. Uh, it's probably the ultimate test of one's libertarian philosophy. Forget who will build the roads, how do you make sure that buildings that are the, the foundation of our, our civilization, how do you make sure that all the parties work, work together and that there's enough safeguards in place that the, the building or some of the structure inside is not going to fault? Exactly, exactly. I mean, there's, we can agree there's a lot of red tape that just gets frustrating from government, and but there's a lot of it that's there as well particularly in construction, to save lives. So it's, it's finding that, that balance and trying to avoid conflicts of interest and corruption.
as you've said, I've, I've done a fair few videos on those. And it's interesting because those videos I can actually share on my LinkedIn and not get slammed. Because, <laughs> because you know, the, the political ones I'll share on LinkedIn and then you'll get some town planner that I may have worked in hammer me and go, I'm never going to work with you again. And then I'll get another, a quiet little private message from an engineer going, yeah, I completely agree with what you're saying. Good, good on you for putting it out there. So it's kind of a mix. So if you shared them in the libertarian groups, that that's probably where the controversy would be. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah that that's true. But you know, is, isn't it the meme? You know, someone becomes uh, discovers libertarianism, and then you know, I'm so happy to share these ideas, and then they're on fire five minutes later <laughs> from from just arguments and discussions and debates. Yeah, uh, too right. Now, on your website, uh, you've even though you're on Facebook. Uh, YouTube, you've also got a podcast uh, feed, It's it all converges on your uh, website. And one of the things I found, you've got a freedom map, which you have all these different measurements of, of freedom, mainly in Australia. Can you just elaborate how that operates and how you decided on the certain measurements to, to make it functional? Uh, it's it's a, an experiment I'm testing, trying to track any instances where I'd say the uh, authoritarianism that I, I would say is growing from the left side is quenching the ability of people to engage in public discourse or debate or, or areas where you know where you can't walk freely or places where you can't go into Australia depending on your race without a permit. I need to add some of those onto it as well. So I, I've cast a very wide net and the idea was that I could visually represent it on a map so people could appreciate what was happening better than just seeing a few newspaper articles, seeing something here, seeing a blog there, saying, oh, wait a minute, you know, pick up their phone, oh, wait, I'm in a, a anti-university that isn't against free speech, that kicked these people out because of these protests. Oh, they don't sound so extreme. One's, you know, Patina Ard, whose uh, grandmother talking about a uh, made-up rape crisis. Why did they kick her out? or um, you know parts of Sydney where you can't walk without the police coming and moving your way. So it's still a, a bit, I've, I've been a bit, um, another example would be here in Queensland. Now with our new legislation that's in place with regards to abortions, there's exclusion zones around all the abortion clinics. So where you, you know, people can't peacefully protest, they can't congregate. That's a space where your speech is restricted. So and your freedoms are restricted. So I'm trying, it's more uh, seeing where our political liberties are being uh, attacked and restricted visually. And uh, so it's a work in progress. If any of your, your viewers have any examples of their freedom that's restricted and they want to share it with me, please let me know and I'll have a look at it and get it up there just to, to get an understanding of it. One thing that encouraged me was all the, the reports from Melbourne of the, the gang violence that's going on there and how everyone's saying, oh, there's no problem, there's nothing. But then you look at a news article here, here, here and here and you see, oh, you put it on a map. Oh, wait a minute. Like you said before, Mumbai was every every year. It's a regular thing and you can see it on the map. It's happening here, here or these the other suburbs where you can identify where there are these, these social issues. So it's kind of like a, a, a police map with that regard. So it's a work in progress. And uh, I'm the only man doing it at the moment using my architectural and visualization skills. So hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll grow as I get more. Well, now hopefully it won't grow. We won't, we will have more freedom and I can delete things. <laughs> yeah. That'd be good if you didn't have to do it. Now the categories you've got listed, I've just brought it up, uh, property damage, riots, gang violence, one to each city, uh, that'll be in, uh, I, I like Melbourne. Sorry. I like Melbourne. Yeah political assault, uh, incidents, organizations, and anti-free speech areas. Well, I think you can include all of Australia with that. <laughs> and it'd be good if, if this could uh, get more engagement, because I certainly think it's a, a worthwhile project. And yeah, I'd definitely try and promote it a, a bit more, because it would certainly be, if everyone was collaborating on it, it would be quite uh, an informative resource. I, I think it definitely would be, and it would wake up a lot of normal people as well to what's going on. Because when you know when you're in the this this you're watching YouTube, you're vlogging, you're talking about these things, you're going to conferences and meeting other people. Uh, in some ways, you can be in a bit of a bubble, and you talk to a normal person about this stuff, and they look at you like you're nuts. 
One thing I've noticed with a lot of the Opal Tower um, content I've been producing is, you know, on, on YouTube, you've got related channels on, yeah. your, on your feed. My related channels include a current affair, nine news. I think I had a current affair next to the Sargon of a card at one stage or the quartering. So I'm getting the, these alternative commentators and then I'm getting complete mainstream mum and dad. So I'm hoping, you know, they'll watch uh, a Opal Tower and then watch a few other things and start to question what they're being provided or the one news source they're looking at just to, to be a bit skeptical about what they've got. But we'll see. We'll see how it goes. I may just get them all angry and they'll just go away, but you never know. I'm finding that more and more people are turning to the alternative media. The mainstream media is getting worse. Their, their lies are getting exposed. Their presenters are becoming more unhinged. The public's waking up and, and losing faith because there's the internet these days. Things can be debunked easily. You know, they don't simply trust the, the man on the 6 p.m. news. The time of the independent journalist funded by the crowd, the mob, you know, through Patreon or a less politically divisive platform like Subscribestar it is becoming a reality. And, uh, you know, you can follow several different independent journalists or, or, or vloggers or anyone to, to get a variety of information. And then, you know, they're not dependent on their paycheck from News Corp. And I think if, if you remove people from the, the corporate news environment and they give them the freedom, there's, they're more likely to be ethical. Maybe I'm just being being naive. <laughs> uh, you, you tell me. Well, that, uh, that's what we like to believe, but I think mainstream media, it's it's on the way down. Its its structure is, you've only got to see the, the recent layoffs at uh, BuzzFeed, HuffPost, to see that the corporate model of, of media is, is unsustainable in this age. W one thing also is just the time restrictions. So when you see someone go on, on news, they'll have like a 15 second clip or a few minutes. And we're getting used to long form content. I mean, I, I'll listen to a Joe Rogan podcast when I'm doing the dishes or something, you know, for a couple of hours, <laughs> you know, when you're doing chores. So and you'll get the full details of, of a uh, situation or you'll listen to world class lectures and these type of things, not just the tiny soundbite. Mm. And uh, I, I think that's an opportunity. And we're quite lucky, actually, to have access to that because, you know, a generation ago, we didn't. So you just, you believe everything you, you're fed. Yeah, it's amazing the amount of information and education that's at our fingertips. We can just go on an app and we can get, as you said, hours and hours of, of content most of the time uh, for free, though we encourage uh, people if they support independent media, uh, contribute. Uh, but yeah, there's so much on, on offer. It's going to be more and more challenging to, or oh, it'll be interesting to see the next election here in Australia, how it happens and how social media will affect it. I think the problem we have here is a, a lack, or in Australia, compared to other places in the world, is a real lack of political engagement by a lot of people. A lot of people just, you know, they don't care, they don't worry about it. They'll go, they'll tick their box their father did, or they'll just, you know, get their sausage at the voting day and just cross everything out and or not even know who they're voting for. And yeah, uh, th that's pretty accurate. Uh, there's a lot of people who probably don't even know that we've got a, a new prime minister or who the, the deputy prime minister is. A lot of people, they just decide in during the election campaign or just vote the way their, their parents did and then it's done. I understand five, you can get a 5% swing on the day by handing out the how to vote cards. That can make a 5% difference to the voters. They make their decision there. Mm. That's how much it goes down to the wire. <laughs> yes. If you've got a better graphics artist, you could win the election. Now, you're based in Brisbane, even though uh, <laughs> you spend a lot of your focus on Melbourne, uh, dare I say it, Melbourne <laughs> bashing, though I'm going to give it back to you. I think that Brisbane and Queensland is is on the, the same path down. I mean, you've got a far-left uh, Premier in Anastasia Palaszczuk, who just got re-elected with an even further left uh, Premier, uh, Jackie Trad. Uh, they're trying to sabotage the Adani uh, coal project. There's been a lot of controversy over the, the land clearing laws, really trying to crush what has been the, the lifeblood 
of uh, Queensland and with the population becoming more centred in southeast Queensland becoming more urbanised then you're sort of getting the same sort of inner city bubbles that occur in Melbourne and Sydney which uh, fester with leftist progressive thoughts. Before I answer that, I, I grew up in Coldstream in Victoria, okay, so down mm -hmm. near the Yarra Valley, so I'm not Melbourne Bashan. I didn't know what rugby was until I moved up here in high school, <laughs> but um, Queensland's a funny state, okay, we, we're a funny state. We, we get all the character politicians, you know, we've got Hanson appeared years ago and you, we've got Caddo, all, all of the, the characters come out of Queensland, particularly the northern part of the state. And a few things that you mentioned, one I'd like to really highlight, and I, I did a video on this, it was uh, the tree clearing laws and the restrictions. And one example was a, a, you know, a farmer whose, house, whose property was completely destroyed, burned out, so he wanted to clear some bush, fire breaks, get his bulldozer, clear it to protect what he owned. And in the end, apparently after talking to 30 different people, he made the fire break a little bit too big. And you know that all the trees he cleared was what worth 14 grand that that pit lumber that was the mm. value of it and he ended up getting fined a million bucks yeah disgusting. The legal fees. and the problem is our last uh, conservative premier that we had here was uh, newman and he really pushed to let's say reduce the inefficiencies in our wonderful public sector and of course, he upset certain uh, groups with uh, significant political power that managed to rally the masses and got him kicked out really quick, the little dictator. And now we've been stuck with what a premier that, that I can't tell you what she's done of any significance in the last period. Uh, you know, maybe there was a fire. She went up there and ran around a little bit. I think she, Labor was shocked they actually won that first election, the first time round. But it just shows you how how our, uh, our state is responding. I'm, I'm quite interested in in state politics because that has a big impact on our day-to-day -day lives. And even, you know, the Queensland Police, they've got a policy 50% male-female at the academy there. So they're discriminating against uh, men. They're hiring women on the, the second round that wouldn't have gotten through and, and not getting the men through. And that's a state policy there that, that I think uh, needs to be addressed. And you've got all, all the, the safe schools as well that's coming through the education system that, that we can blame Victoria for. So I think it all, it all came there and spread out from there. Yeah, um, Ros Ward, uh, native Melbourneian at La Trobe University. The value of, of that uh, on our, for our education system when you actually look at the Australians' rankings compared to other countries around the world, we're dropping. We are dropping education-wise. We we don't have. We're not at the same level where we used to be, and every year we're going down the quality of education. But of course, then we need to spend millions on these other programs that have marginal benefit, and and these are all all state issues. So, from kind of a, a activist perspective, we've just gotten the bag ban here. I don't know if you have that. Can you still you get plastic bags in Victoria? Well, we can. Even though we have a, a far-left progressive Labor government, they still haven't gotten around to officially banning the plastic bags, so they're pretty scarce now. I, I make a point of going to the shops, and you can still get the bags for the fruit and veg, and I'll just put everything in that, <laughs> just out of spite. And I know it's very petty, it's very childish, but I, I had an argument with, a, an, I think it was a Greens activist, and... He was ended up getting to the point where he said, um, if people won't change, you need to force them to change. <laughs> that was the end of our Facebook dialogue. And I said, well, mate, you're an authoritarian. And then, of course, he, he stopped the discussion. But it just shows you all these little things are chipping away at our freedoms that we have one at another at another. So I don't know where the state's going to head. It'll be interesting to see the next uh, the next election. I think our, our premier, uh, the, well, the alternative, the liberal candidate, uh, is looking at adopting some infrastructure projects, maybe some dams, like our, our good Senator Mr. Anning has put forward as, as one suggestion. I mean, I, I'm, I'm completely biased when it comes to mining, okay? My business, uh, we grew uh, doing, you know, the mine industry areas for Cavill Ridge and Dornier, two coal mines up in the Bowen Basin that helped me start my business, buy my home. So I like mining. I think it's fantastic. I, I think anything that can encourage uh, industry for the regions uh, should be pushed and just the way the whole mess with Adani and I mean you looked at the 
Labour conference that they had in Adelaide. There were even Adani protesters there coming up. And so I, I don't understand how a Labour party, which is meant to represent workers, can be against a coal mine, which needs workers. Uh, don't get me started on the, the contradictions of the, the left. They're always uh, eating their, their various competing interests, which brings me to the, the final topic. Do you see the, the left and their agenda as the, the greatest threat to freedom in Australia? Obviously, uh, we've mentioned the, the consequences of immigration, especially here in Melbourne. There's a lot of civil liberties that we're losing, which uh, do include free speech, and there's the, the continued economic uh, mismanagement, both at the, the state and federal uh, levels, where the, the debt and waste continues. Well, the biggest issue I think we have with the left side of politics in this country is that they can't have reasonable debate anymore. Mm, definitely. Uh, they've adopted identity politics. You've got, you know, politicians in, in your, your lovely state there pushing for the, the wage gap and claiming that and using that as part of their policy and wanting to mandate it on councils. If you even want to have a discussion about immigration, you're branded a racist. You're branded a racist. And yeah. you, you know, boom, boom, typical response. Uh, back in the day, back when you, I mean, when you had Hawke, when you had Keating, you know, when you had uh, Labour of eras gone past, you could at least have a discussion between the two sides of politics and hopefully reach a compromise. I really get the feeling now that in some ways we're adopting the bad uh, habits of the states where people are identifying with their, their gang, their tribe, and they don't even want to engage in a dialogue or they don't even want to see things from both sides. And in that regard, I think the you know, ideological possession of the left in this country is heading down a, a scary path. And maybe, maybe if we have, you know, a, a hor horrific economic term from the next Labour government, it might wake a few people up going, oh, wait a minute, socialism isn't all roses and happiness. Oh, wait, you mean I can't do this freedom or I can't do this, what I've done my whole life? What, what are you saying? Maybe that might wake a few people up. But I, I think that's the my biggest concern is the fact that now you, it, it, they're even struggling to have a dialogue. The liberals, they're lurching more and more left all the time. They, there was even calls for, for gender quotas for their members. I think more people are going to be attracted to the smaller parties to represent their choices in this next election, but then other people are also burned out by them. So. Uh, the, the pending Labour government, I say that with a lot of certainty, it's, it's going to be a, a good demonstration about how a society falls apart even though it's going to be horrendous because we both know the lesson of economics that you cannot just tax and regulate your way to uh, prosperity but that's probably uh, what we need and for things to get worse before they can get better. Sadly I think you're right on the money there uh, but you have to remember there's a generation that doesn't know what a recession is that's never experienced one, that have always had a, the next job lined up, you know, it was good times. Back when I was a, a uni student at working, you'd go from one job to another getting a pay rise, pay rise, pay rise, pay rise, because it was, it was flat out. Those times don't exist anymore. Well, we'll be both here uh, in the next few years to say to everyone, I told you so. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be, be sticking around because it is going to be quite a, a bumpy ride. I think some of my viewers are saying to buy gold and bury uh, rifles. Or buy Bitcoin. I'll be <laughs> Let's not get into crypto. It's gonna, I'm still, I'm still, I still got burnt. Yeah, we'll put a lid on this uh, show for now. So I've enjoyed uh, speaking with you today, Florian. Keep going with your uh, grueling uh, video uh, schedule. You certainly are adding to uh, the conversation uh, quite a bit. And yeah, I'd like to chat to you again sometime. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Really appreciate it. And uh, you know, we should get a beer next time you're up in Queensland or I come and visit down in Melbourne. Yeah, definitely. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. 
As always, at the end of every show, uh, I stress that The Unshackled, we can, can only continue with our mission and producing the work we do at The Unshackled with the support of our followers. There are many ways you can support us. You can pledge over at patreon.com slash The Unshackled and directly via our PayPal link at paypal.me slash The Unshackled. We also have our premium membership option on our website, theunshackled.net slash support options slash premium membership. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next show. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.